Hey, hey, Tony guys here, just popping in. Now, listen, I seen this clip, and it was uh, Desi Banks and Shannon Sharp seen that on my, was it, it was on Instagram. But it's something that I talk about in my book, The Dream Chaser. If you have not read The Dream Chaser, get a copy of it. They still send me a royalty check, so I guess I could promote it. Go get The Dream Chaser. I tell my whole story from zero to 100 all the way through but it's a concept in that book that i talk about and this is something that we need to think about because I, i'm seeing this a lot and it's something that's being <laughs> misunderstood and and this has to change in order for black men to grow and change and evolve one of the and this is this is gonna be hard to hear, but one of the biggest reasons why black men are in the state that we are in is because of the enabling from the black woman. If you think about it, grandma would bail out her son from jail over and over and over again. Grandma would bail out her grandson over and over and over again. Mama will fight the teacher for her son being disrespectful in the classroom. Mama will excuse her son's behavior regardless of what he did. Son is always innocent. Then what I see now is black women taking care of black men. I just seen a video. I came on YouTube getting ready to shoot a video and I see the short of a black woman she got a muffin top, what y'all call it, fupa muffin top. And she, now with her being built unbecoming, she still had on a one-piece bodysuit. So that man putting that leg on her, putting that meat leg on her, got her feeling frivolent, fresh, and voluptuous. She pull up to her car. And she said, what is my car doing over here? A lady come out on her cell phone recording the lady that come to look at her car. And the lady say, what is Calvin doing over here? And the other lady was like, I, you need to talk to Calvin. She said, tell Calvin to come out here. She said, I ain't going in there to tell Calvin nothing. Here you got two black women, both of them built in a way that they don't want to be built, but just the way that the body fall after maybe kids or after the age of 40 or 50 or whatever it is, you got two women built almost identically. The one coming out the house, she built a little worse. And Calvin sleeping with both of them. He putting hard, unprotected thing in both of these women to the point that the one little woman then got Calvin a car. She got a car in her name that she made the payments on and Calvin driving it. This is the problem. So what Desi Banks' ex did, what he said his ex didn't believe in his dream, it's not that his ex ain't believe in the dream. He say she put him out in the middle of the night one night and that she had been telling him, you know, this thing taking a long time. You online shooting videos, having fun. But the bills is not fun. But you living in this house as a grown man now. And then... He say he had a job and he used to give her the money. He just wanted to get him a haircut. But then later after that, he say she told him he need to go get a job. So that means he always had no, he ain't keeping a job for her to say you need to go get a job or get a better paying job, which is what a man need to do. If you sleeping with a woman, then you getting husband benefits. A husband pay bills. A husband don't just chase a dream. So what I talk about in the dream chaser, I didn't title it that. I would not have titled it that because that's Meek Mill record label, dream chaser. But 
this it was a white publishing company and I guess read my story, maybe they didn't heard of Meek Mill. They they titled it The Dream Chaser. And so here you have this man go on the show gaslighting his ex because she had standards to say you need to get a real job. I don't care nothing about you shooting these videos, shooting these little raggedy skits outside of work. But if you finna live up in here and be putting hard anger lane off in me, you got to help pay these bills. Ain't nothing wrong with that. But the audacity of a blight man, this is what we be doing. We expect to live off a woman while we chase a fantasy. See, it's a difference between a dream and a fantasy. See, a fantasy is rooted in pleasure. It's rooted in fame. It's rooted in a desire for fame, notoriety, and money. A dream is rooted in purpose. Meaning you have a dream to get somewhere to a place where you have a platform where you can change the world by doing purposeful heart work. Whether you saving young children, whether you helping people in need, you are living your purpose. It's not that you just rich and famous. You're living your purpose and you're promoting your purpose so that other people will also tap into purpose. Because everybody love to say, uh, how you know? Uh, how you know what he doing? How you know what she doing? How you know what they do behind closed door? We don't do nothing without promoting it. So don't come try to tell me you helping all the homeless and you helping all this and you ain't got no camera. And to be honest with you, people say, oh, don't show your good deeds. You know why, why in the social media age, we post to show good deeds? So more people could tap in and more people could help. So more people could see an example. Because it's like, you might as well show your good deeds if you're going to show your Maybach trucks. If you're going to show your big houses, if you're going to show your diamond jewelry, at least show yourself doing something good. Because anything you show, other people want to do, other people want to have. So show what you're doing for the community as much as you show whatever else you you famous for and see this the thing as men we have to accept responsibility and this one thing i always believe so what i'm doing right now i'm living a dream i'm living a dream because i earn a living teaching what life has taught me i earn a living teaching what life has taught me one-eyed man in the land of the blind, meaning if I'm on a topic that people have not experienced yet, they blind to it. If I could see it, then I teach it. I teach that on YouTube. YouTube pay me. I teach it in online courses. I sell the online courses. I could be selling drugs. I could be doing scamming. I could be doing construction. I could be doing door-to-door -door sales. I could be doing medical device sales. I could be doing anything. But what I'm teaching is changing people's life. It's helping them lead toxic relationships. It's helping them become purpose-based, purpose-driven entrepreneurs. It's helping them change their life. So I'm living my purpose, but I'm also living a dream. Because I, I sit here... I've been reading a book today. I've been reading all day. You know, I sent me out an email selling one of my courses that I just released. I just released Kingdom Wife, Kingdom Husband. It's me sharing God-given wisdom. Now, I could charge $97 for the course. The course is right now is $14 because Valentine's is on the 14th day of February, so I made it $14. I was going to make it $2.14, but my wife, because February 14th, but my wife told me, and not in celebration of holiday. I don't celebrate the holiday. It just recognizing what the whole world is focused on. I just, but it ain't my holiday. So I don't want to hear no whole history of Jack Valentine or who of Valentine. It's thus is the day the Lord has made. And so, 
My wife said, no, you better not $2.14, $14. So I sold $14. Ain't nothing but a couple hundred people going to get the course. So it ain't like I'm running to the bank and just, woo. And I go, it's a couple hundred people that are signed up for the course, but still, I'm a teacher. And my dream growing up, I wanted to be a school teacher and a basketball coach. So I ain't coaching basketball, but I'm still a teacher. And I was getting ready to say while I was reading my book, and I got one coaching call today. So that's the, the gist of my job. Sell courses, do YouTube videos, and do one-on-one -on -one sessions. That's three different things that I do in one day. And that earns a living. Why? Because I put in the time over a decade to build a following. I didn't build a following. I was consistent sharing my gift and the people came. If you build it, they will come. But before I started doing this full time, do you know what I did? I worked 40 hours a week from the age of 21 when I got kicked off my college football team. I went to work. I didn't have, I wasn't living with a woman. I wasn't in no relationship. I was in a relationship, but I wasn't living with no woman. It was a long distance relationship with my ex. And I went, I came home. I was working in the grocery store, stocking a grocery. I quit the job because it was too many women coming in there. And I ain't like being seen stocking grocery. I felt like they were looking down on me. And I was trying to holler at the women that would come in there. And, I, and it worked. I did holler at one of the young ladies came in there, end up, you know, going all the way. We ain't dated or nothing, but went all the way. And so I was like, wow, okay, I'll pick it up one stocking grocery. So then I went to the warehouse. The warehouse work was too hard. I was there about two months, two and a half months. I quit before the evaluation. Then I went full time to the streets, back to selling weed in the streets, started me a modeling troupe called the Dazzling Dimes, eight girls. Go to the club and twerk. The guys throw money on the stage. I pick up the money. I get I, I get the dancers, whoever danced, who did the twerking. I gave them, they cut, and then I took my 10%. It was not lucrative at all. In the streets hustling. Was not going, was not no kingpin trying to do nothing crazy. Just making me a little money. Bills start to mount up. Car note due. I'm in the mall shopping. Rent due on the apartment. Guess what? I met my wife. Me and her had got back together. We was together at the warehouse for them couple months. She bought my steel toe boots. My wife bought my steel toe boots. They had a, only one size left. It was too little for me, but I was in there working in them steel toe boots, a size too small. We broke up after two, three months. She went back to her ex. I went back to my ex. Her ex was in person. My ex was long distance. She broke up with her ex again after two months. I stayed with my ex for six months. Me and my wife bumped back into each other six months later. When we bumped back into each other, I broke up with my ex again because I had to left her for my wife once. When my wife left me, I went back to my ex. Then, my, then I left my ex again when me and my wife bumped back into each other. Me and my wife bumped back into each other, and we was married 10 months later. When I got back with my wife, at first I was in the streets hustling. I was selling drugs, and I had the dazzling dimes. She gave me about a month or two and was like, you're going to have to let the Dazzling Dimes go. I think it was embarrassing or making her look bad because I looked like I looked like an organized pimp because it would be out in the, on the strip, on the club strip and in the clubs. And it will be just me, one guy with eight girls. And then sometimes I let a couple of my homeboys from home come. So it'll be two or three of us guys and the eight girls. And so it just was a bad look. And then I was selling drugs. Now, when I came back, now this part of the story that, I can't tell my wife's story. I had to let her tell her story. But my wife, she was there with me. For the, about a couple months, she was like, okay, get it together. Get it together. Get it together. So I went and I got a job. I working 40 hours a week. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I, I wanted to do something. I wanted to write a book. I wanted to, I had already wrote my book. I wanted to write a book. I wanted to do something special. Had I wrote the book? No, I hadn't wrote the book. I wanted to write a book. And my wife, I remember she said to me, when I wanted to write that book, I left the streets and I was working full time, 40 hours a week. And she helped me write that book. That book cost, remember she bought my steel toe boots when I was at the warehouse. Then came back 
she put me on her phone bill. I had a little red flip phone. I, I went off on my ex, dog and I went open my phone, the ink disappeared off the screen of the phone. Little red phone from Verizon. Screen disappeared. I went through tough time. I was mismanaging my street money. So I wasn't paying my bills. The phone got cut off. Car almost got repossessed and got evicted from my apartment. This is me as a single man. Meet my wife. She let me move in with her. I move in with her. She put me on her. She put me on her phone plan. I got a car. I'm on her phone plan. And I'm living with her. Pretty much. I, I went and got me another apartment. But I wasn't going to be there for long. And I pretty much stand with my wife every day. And then my wife moved out her apartment with one roommate. She moved to a townhouse with another roommate. And she let me live there with her. So I live there. I'm working full time. My wife ended up working at the same place I was working at. It was a group home. She working full time. Now, both of us working full time, working 40 hours a week. Toward the end of that year, this 2006, towards the end of that year, read my book, The Dream Chaser. You'll see the whole story. I started writing my book, my first book, What Daddy Never Told His Little Girl. My wife gave me the $1,300 to publish that book. She gave me the $1,300 to publish that book. What I'm trying to tell you, this is what love is made of. Oh, it's okay for a woman to support a man. But what I learned from my wife, the way she did it, is she said, I'm going to support you as long as you're willing to work. I'm going to support you as long as you're willing to balance the dream and the job until the dream becomes the job. Not no sitting home without no job chasing a fantasy of being a rapper or being a, a internet comedian or a stand-up comedian, but not making no full-time living wage. You have to balance the dream and the job until the dream becomes the job. So if a woman say, this right here dream ain't working out, you need to go get a job. That don't mean you can no longer make your funny videos online, but you could do that when you get off of work. You could do that before work, or you could batch record on your two days off that you get a week. You get two days off a week. Batch record on them two days, but on them other five days, you need to be gainfully employed. You can't just be laying up here and just because you got a hard dang -a lane, think you finna be laying up here and chasing a fantasy. Because at the end of the day, one thing we know is when you're in the entertainment industry, it go up and down. It ain't no once you make it, you, you'd have made it. <laughs> look how many broke comedians it is. It don't look like a, a lot of these comedians that we watched on BT's Comic View, all this stand-up, Comedy Central, a lot, of, a lot of them down bad. So you still got to learn how to work. You got to learn how to work. And so it was wrong for the young man to go on there. And I like his work. I think he's funny. But I, he probably ain't never connected with me because he probably knew what he was doing in that relationship and knew I wouldn't condone it. But I don't, I don't like when we as men go on podcasts and gaslight our ex. Now, it's different if your ex went and got her some hard angling put in her by your homeboy. Okay, light up, flame her. She nasty, low down dirty. But you can't make a woman look bad because you living with her and bills are mounting and she say you need to get a job because all you're doing with your time is shooting skits trying to be famous online that's not no real job that's a fantasy and that is the problem today with black men is everybody want to be in the entertainment industry everybody want to be an entertainer and everybody want to be rich from entertainment but don't nobody want to work don't nobody want to do right. So everybody is selling drugs, scamming, or trying to entertain. And then you have charlatans and fake people who trying to do what I do, but don't want to live the life that go with it. They want to be a single relationship expert. They want to be a broke financial expert. 
They want to be a barely making it financial teacher, but ain't, ain't got no money really stacked up. Ain't created no generational wealth, but want to teach about money and finances and getting out of debt. But ain't got no wife, ain't got no kids. So don't even know what real debt and what real money look like when you got to take care of your wife and multiple children. That's when you really understand as a man how to manage some money. That's when you're going to realize a credit card might go be needed. You probably going to have to learn how to have good debt. You're going to have to learn how to manage that credit card when you got a wife and children. It, unless you finna have your cash envelope system and your wife walk around looking like Raggedy Ann and your kids looking like who shot John and forgot to kill him because you don't want to stretch no money. You don't want to flip no money. And see, that's the problem is we want to be talking about stuff we ain't got no business talking about, talking about stuff we don't know what we talk about. We want to be single and giving relationship advice. We want to be in open relationships, giving relationship advice. We want to be all of this right here and don't want to do what we got to do. And this is the thing. The same way them two women will take care of Calvin. Calvin butt over there putting hard anger laying in this woman when she need to be working out and working on her body. Then he putting hard anger laying in this woman and she need to be working out, working on her three Bs. And both of these women are sleeping with Calvin. Calvin driving a brand new car. The woman he over here cheating with got a whole house. Live on a in a cul-de-sac. Calvin got one woman who done bought him a car. Black woman. Got another woman who got a house in a nice neighborhood. He got two successful, established, single, desperate black women that cannot tell that they being cheated on until this woman trike her car because she felt something in her spirit because why else you trike in the car if Calvin at the job, if Calvin working? She try, she like, where is Calvin at right now in this car that I'm paying for because he, he don't work today. So her spirit went to... <laughs> Uh, she she pull up a car on the app. Hold on, now. this car sitting at this house, at this address. She catch an Uber. She catch an Uber. Or have somebody drop off. She probably called an Uber because if it was her homegirl, her homegirl would have been in the camp. Would have been in the shot. She'd have been standing behind her. Get Calvin now. Nah. Help before we drag you. So she called an Uber, and she had the other key. She unlocked it, boop, hop right in there, left Calvin. Now, I bet Calvin could go right back to her. If you see this and you the lady who bought that car, get in the comments and tell me if you took Calvin back. Let me know if you took a bite now. The lady that was over there with the house, if you see this video and Cal you still sleeping with Calvin, tell the truth. Tell the truth. Calvin ought to be single. Calvin ought to be single as a dollar bill. He ought to be single as a dollar bill. But see, I doubt it. I bet one of them women still dealing with them, if not both of them. And so here's the thing. Black men, we got to grow up. You got to grow up. You got to learn how to mature. You got to learn how to work your job. Work you a job. Find you a wife. Be 100% faithful to your wife. And take care of your business. Stop chasing fantasies and chase a dream. But understand that even if you chase a dream, you got to maintain a full-time job while you chasing that dream. I became what I am today, but I was working 40 hours a week. 40 hours a week. And then when I left that job, you know what I did? I did a business deal with a male friend. My wife wasn't floating me. My wife wasn't working. So it went from her supporting me to me supporting her. Because when we had our son, he was in the intensive care unit for about three months. So my wife went there every single day. Then when he came home, he came home on a feeding tube that we had to fill up the bag with the oatmeal and water. And it, gold into, and it went into his stomach. And then you got to wash it out. And we had to do that every two hours. So we was up throughout the night. I'm losing my mind. She losing her mind because we is unslept and unkept. It was the hardest thing ever. 
and we living in a little apartment with no furniture. We had a bed and we had a dresser and a TV and we had no living room furniture and we had our son crib and we let that stay in the living room. And I would get up every two hours. And then when I was about to lose my mind, because I had to work 40 hours a week still, then she would start getting up. But now she going through postpartum and she losing her mind. We about lost our mind. Both of us about lost our mind, but it was God. And we would be in there. I remember when, when I paid the bills out of my check, that was $680 every two weeks. $680 every two weeks. I would pay the bills. We would have about $25 for the next two weeks. The bills would be paid. Our son was paying a portion of the rent. Our son was pretty much about paying the rent because he was getting $700 a month. The rent was $835. Then we had two. We had my car note. And I think I stupidly went and got us another car note. I think we ended up with two car notes. Her car and my car. And then my car got stole. And so we just had her car, but then she went and got a loan from her stepdaddy. Her stepdaddy got a $5,000 loan. She took that $5,000 and she went and bought me a $3,500 Lexus. So here she was, was not working, but she got that loan and we paid that loan $100 a month. That loan was forever. We paid that loan. We paid that $5,000 loan off not long ago. This was so long ago. And her stepdaddy, shout out to, to Chester. Man, Chester, he held it down, man. And, and, man, let me make some real money, man. I'm going to bless Chester. And that, that Lexus lasts me for one year. Cause, and my wife supported me in my stupidity. As long as I was willing to work 40 hours a week, because I shouldn't have been driving no Lexus. And the other car that we had before the Lexus, I had traded in her fully paid Honda Civic. Fully paid. You know Honda Civic is reliable. I traded in for a C240 Benz. That Benz cost us so much money because it was so raggedy. We bought it off one of them lots that was not a Mercedes Benz lot. This was my ghetto stupidity. Wanting to look like something and live outside of my means as a 23-year-old man. And my wife, she stood there in my stupidity. But she said, you're going to get it together. You got to get it together. And I went back to the street selling some weed. And she said, no, she left me. So here she was, she was okay with my bad financial decisions of trading in a fully paid in car, paid for a car to get a C240 Benz so I could, for my ego, because I wanted to look like something because I hadn't come out the streets selling, selling weed. And then here she was, this was after my, my Impala on 22s got stole and I got that Benz and then the Benz was so tore up from the flow up, I can't remember what we did with it. Oh. I end up getting my car stole. She got me the Lexus. I think we had the Lexus and we had the Benz. <laughs> living, living, in, living in a little ragged apartment, man, that my son was paying for. But this was me, stupid. And I still do same stupid stuff today, too, but I just got more earning potential. And so, listen, I ain't perfect because I make bad financial decisions. But one thing that's solid is my character. I'm 100% faithful to my wife. My wife took care of She got everything she needs. Right now, she's getting the hair done. Tomorrow, she's getting the real hair do. Yesterday, she just did a facial and a massage. She took care of. That one thing about it, and it's 100% legal. But see, what I'm trying to show you is the caveats and the nuances and the balance. So if you're going to support a man, that man got to be willing to work 40 hours a week. See, I wasn't sitting on my behind selling weed. I come out the streets to, to, be, to honor my wife. See, honor and obey go both ways. She said, you got to get out these streets because we just had a son. If you get arrested, you going to prison. We live in Florida. My uncle got arrested. They offered him a year and a day. He turned it down, went to trial. They gave him 40 years. He went from a year and a day to a 40-year sentence, but he only got to do 30. <coughs> and then the 30 got cut down to 27. He done served 17 or 18 years. I read the transcript from court. You know what they charged him with? Possession with intent to sell. Ten dollars worth of marijuana, ten dollars worth of cocaine. He doing twenty seven years. Polk County, Florida. Ronnie L. Johnson, R O N N I E, L middle initial Johnson, last name J O H N S O N. Look it up. Ronnie L. Johnson. Look up Polk County. Polk County Sheriff dot org. 
Ronnie L. Johnson, you're going to see he's doing 27 years. You read the court transcripts, $10 worth of marijuana, $10 worth of weed. That's what my wife was trying to save me from. And I listened to her. Because we was at working at the group home. When she was working there, her co-worker was there. Her co-worker, baby daddy, got arrested for selling drugs and got seven years in prison. She came home and she told me, such and such, baby daddy just got seven years in prison. She said the same thing going to happen to you if you don't stop selling drugs. And when I went back to sell drugs, ignoring her and listening to my my cousin, who was my cousin and my homeboy, and he was my plug, he said, man, she, she, cuz, go home and tell her, you ain't going to be complaining when this money coming in. I went home and I said, listen, you ain't going to be complaining when this money coming in. She looked at me like I was stupid and she walked out the door. I tried to hold her. She kicked me off, hit me with a six piece, and she left. I called and begged and begged and begged. We read my book. Um, a woman's influence. I talk about the 72 hour rule. That's where that come from. Cause for 72 hours, she ain't answer the phone. I'm calling 80 times of the day. She ain't answer the phone on that. After that 72 hours, she picked up that phone and she said, I don't know what she said. How can I help you? What, what? I said, listen, please come back. Please give me one more chance. Please. She said, I'm gonna give you one more chance for our family, for our son. Our son was in intensive care unit still. And she said, you're going to have to stop selling drugs. She said, you're going to have to go to anger management for putting your hands on me, trying to hold her. Because I was bear hugging her, trying to hold her from her. She said, you're going to have to go to anger management for trying to hold me. And I think she said, you got to cut off your friends or something like that. Or you got to get back in the church. I said, you got it. I still hadn't learned my lesson. Still hadn't grown. Was coming home. Shot my shot at the lady who had a Mustang with some 20s or 22s on it. Got a phone number, but when I got a phone number, I realized she was unattractive. So I wasn't finna call anyways, but it was me fighting for my ego. And this is what we try to do. This is a real life story that a lot of women, you don't, it'd be a lot of women who try to use my story against them, realizing I'm doing something for you that no other black man online is doing for you. I'm giving you the behind the scenes of a man mind and what we really be doing to try to help you understand black men better. And then you have a, a group of stupid peanut gallery women who are coming. Tony Gaffey did it. Yeah, Tony Gaffey did it. How do you know that? I told you that. For your knowledge so you could understand who you sleeping with. So I come home that night. Me and my wife, we go in the house. Somebody was following me. Somebody was waiting on me. Somebody was looking. Some, somebody was doing something. That very night, I still had not got my lesson because I got that lady phone number on the way home. The Lord saw that. And the Lord knew that I was going to be who I am today, doing what I'm doing today. That night when I went home to the apartment, I went in there and me and my wife made up. Y'all know what made up mean. After that, was hungry. Said, let's go get some Taco Bell. Come down the stairs, go to my parking space. I'm looking for my car. I'm like, man, I forgot where I parked at. I thought I parked right here. So I'm looking around. I don't see my car. I look down. It's glass on the ground now about a week or so before that i had a shorted a drug lord who ran a gang he ran a gang in tampa called the drake boys are you from tampa then you know about the drake boys he he supposedly his name was lord drake i had shorted him two grams short on some some dro which yeah, other people call it chronic or whatever but it's the little it's the highest level of marijuana that look like christmas trees got the little sparkles on it I never smoked it. I never smoked weed, not one time in my life, not even one puff. I didn't even know how to roll a joint, know how to smoke it, but I sold it because I bought that money. And so my cousin was the upline. He used to grow it, kingpin, 20 years in the streets. And so I shorted him two grams, one a lot. His little runner had sat in my car and saw my rim lock was in my car. So either he robbed me because the, the next morning after my car was robbed, the little the, the the little runner who was a rapper, a local rapper who had a song called I'll Pay For It. I pay for it. I pay for it. I pay for it. It was him who sat in my car, him who got the weed from me. And the next morning when I went to work without my car, he called me that morning. I was distraught, devastated. He said, Hey, you good? I was like, Yeah, I'm good. He was like, I just will call and check on you. And so I felt like it was him. But at the same time, my wife had an issue with her old roommate. Something was going on. I don't know what they was going through, but I know they had stole my wife's purse. Her green card was in there because remember my wife from Jamaica. 
her green car was in there. And then they had stole my wife tag off of a Civic. I don't know what it was, but the, they did that to her. So what I went and did for my wife is I shot the lady windows out. She had a car sitting in a parking lot, rode it to the parking lot. I got my, my cousin black on black truck and I shot the lady windows out. And my wife was in the front seat with me when I did it. So I put in work on my wife's behalf now. And so this is how we was living. Now, this is a real story. One day when I find me a good screenwriter, I'm going to turn it into a movie. Because, And I can't say everything right here on here now. But I ain't know who stole my car. But that very night, my car got stole. And that next day, that Sunday, I went to church, rededicated my life to Christ. And from that day forward, I never sold drugs again. I never went back to the streets again. And I've been pursuing the Lord. I've been pursuing the Lord and working on the Lord. And I've been working on me ever since. I'm still working on me to this day. Because I got to over, my mind overthink. I, I will make something out of nothing in an instant. But the Lord gave my wife a special kind of patience to be able to help guide me and support me and help keep me on the straight and narrow. So what I want you to understand is it's a difference between supporting. So what I'm trying to say is black men, we got to accept responsibility and we have to grow and we have to mature as men. But what black women got to do is understand the difference between supporting a man and enabling a man. So by supporting a man, you are demanding and requiring that he does the right thing, that he's living a legal lifestyle and that he is gainfully employed. And then you support him, meaning you are supplemental. So it's okay when he is married to you, when he get married to you, he is in his child's life with you, your children that you got with him. He is gainfully employed and he's living a legal lifestyle. If your man is, is living an illegal lifestyle and you are standing beside him, I'm going to step beside him, you are enabling him. You're crippling him. If your man refuses to submit his ego, surrender his ego and work a job where he got a boss, he got somebody to answer to, if he will not work a job but all he want to do is go to the studio and rap or he want to get online and make skits, or he want to sit and do something stupid just because other people making millions. And yeah, he could probably make millions, but you got to have a job. You got to have a job. You don't quit your job to go make no money. You keep your job and then you got to work eight hours a week. So what I had to do, I wanted to do this, what I'm doing. So I had to work eight hours a week. I worked 40 for them and I worked 40 for me. Writing books. Picture myself on seminars, on teleseminars, doing all of that. And so, listen, it's wrong for a man to go and try to make a woman look bad, talking about she didn't believe in my dream. She did believe in She was laying up with you, sleeping with you. She take care of you. She got a roof over your head. But you took her grace for granted. You took her kindness for weakness. She supposed to kick you out. If you're not finna go work no real job, she supposed to kick you out. She ain't supposed to support that. And, and then when you made it, you should have went back to her because she, she was there for you when you had nothing. Not a woman, not a woman you got, you got her while you up, while you own. You, uh, you owe the woman a thank you for pushing you into purpose because when the woman left you, now you had, now you working to prove her wrong. She the reason you made it. She the reason you're successful. That's what you got to realize. So listen, when I left my job, I left my job for a year, but I did a business deal. So my wife actually did not have to support me. My wife was not working, but we moved out of that neighborhood and we hadn't already moved up to another neighborhood after I got robbed and we was paying for a new neighborhood. Now our rent went from 835 to 935. We moved from the black and lower level white and Hispanic neighborhood to the middle class white apartments. And then when more blacks started moving in, I was like, oh, I got to go. They go to the neighborhood. 
And they done figured it out. I said, well, I thought I had to made it out. Y'all got to forgive me, but that's just a real thought now. That's just a real thought. That just, hey, uh, the white people think they be, the white people think they be saying they go to the neighborhood. Some of us be saying they go to the neighborhood too. I'm like, oh, Lord. <laughs> Two men of y'all moving in now. So guess what? When I did that deal with my white business partner, now I'm using his money. And my wife ain't got to support me jobless. I'm using his money. Boom. He invest in me $35,000. Boom. $2,000 go to a black lady who edits book proposal. She charged me $2,000. It was either $1,500 or $2,000. She charged me to edit my book proposal. I pitched it to a literary agent that I met some kind of way. I can't remember how I met her. The literary agent said, I don't want your book. It was my book, Mrs. Wright. She said, Tony, I don't get it. I think the lady was a lesbian, now that I look back on it. She said, Tony, I don't get the concept of the book. It was a white lady. She was kind of older. She didn't understand. So I wrote Mrs. Wright. And the, the agents didn't want it. They turned it down. I published it myself. But I had them built the following online. So that book, boom, it made $20,000 rather quickly. So now my book is making money. But... My business partner had gave me thirty five thousand. Then after that thirty five thousand, he gave me like another sixty thousand. Then he gave me another fifty thousand. Then he gave me another forty thousand. And so I'm doing business deals. This is all a business loan. This is what the book, the outlier, talk about. A lot of people don't want to talk about this because a lot of people don't want to tell their behind the scenes story or the support that they had or or the the help that they had. A lot of people don't want to tell you about that dope boy that funded their career. A lot of people don't want to tell you about, about that white man that put them on, that put them on and gave them an audience or gave them the support. A lot of people don't want to talk about that. Everybody want to be self-made. But I had that support, which was a business deal now. It wasn't no handout now. Because he got his pound of flesh because he, he was buying 35% of one of my companies. And so now at this point, I got two LLCs. I got two companies. He owned 35% of one of them. And that was a film company. So he was investing in film projects. We shoot in film projects. The documentary Black Love, the reason why Black Love never had me on the documentary is because they stole the concept from me. Because I had did a very similar concept right before Black Love came out. And it was called Where Is He Already? But they didn't want to play on the single black women looking for a man which one of the single black women on the documentary named it that. I didn't name it that. So they wanted to show black love because they say, oh, so this guy, Tony Gaskins, who is the most popular relationship coach right now, just went around the world highlighting. He went around the world highlighting um, the single struggle of black men and women looking for it. Because I interviewed men and I interviewed women of like them looking for love. It's on, it's on my YouTube. You go to my... My videos on here it might be for the blessed tribe or something like that, but it's on there. The whole documentary. So we produced that on forty thousand dollars. Went all the way around the country. It made zero dollars. We produced another documentary that I had the director Matthew A. Cherry, who won an Oscar for his short film of the little black girl, the cartoon little black girl, the dad doing the hair. Matthew A. Cherry was my director on. A, a documentary about the NFL lockout. Me and Matthew fell out because my ego got in the way and he wanted to, to like direct the editing and all of that. And I was like, no, nah, you ain't got to do all that, man. Just stay out of the way. Just let the editor do his thing. And so I usurped the power and overstepped the boundaries and messed it up. And so me and Matthew fell out. Then Matthew won an Oscar. But I had believed in Matthew and got $25,000 before Matthew got that Oscar. And then he ended up doing his own film called The Last Fall, and he had Lance Gross as the lead character in there. He put it on Netflix. And then after that, me and Matthew was, we was both um, mentored by Ava DuVernay. Ava DuVernay is the number one black female director right now in the world. She, had, she did a movie with Oprah, I think, with a $100 million budget. Ava was my mentor. She started my first Gmail email. See, I be on here talking to y'all regular, but I'm really out here connected. Like I really got a real life story to tell. 
and connected to high place, high power people. But I come on here and talk humbly with no lighting and no team talking to you on a cell phone, acting like I ain't nobody and ain't did nothing. But listen to me now, because I knew Ava before she blew up. She was doing publicity for my other mentor's films, David E. Talbert. I found out about Ava DuVernay because I was looking at my mentor, David E. Talbert, credits, and I seen the Ava DuVernay agency in the credits, and I reached out to Ava. I reached out to her. So she helped me, and she told me to get on Twitter. So she told me about Twitter. I ain't really know what Twitter was, and she said, look at Ashton Kutcher and what he doing. She said, you need to be the number one black king on Twitter. And guess what? I became the number one black king on Twitter thanks to Ava DuVernay pushing me into that space. And then I did that film. So here it is, my partner supporting me, supporting me, supporting me. I'm doing these films and I will create these projects and then I'll be scared to promote it. Scared to go put it out there in the film festival. Scared to make money. And I'm just wasting money, wasting money, wasting money. But that's that's the grace and favor that when you work for God, that's what God will do. It might not be many people who ain't sell sell out to God, who ain't get a life to God, who ain't. And, and this is the lie that people tell. I was a womanizer. But then when I got married, I shut that down. It's people out there, uh, Pastor Tim and Jamal Bryant. So here you got Pastor Tim who the now woman want him. When you look at his old videos and you look at his old pictures, he could not buy no woman. And then you got Pastor Jamal Bryant who same thing. He was not no looker. And then women wanted him because he was a big time pastor. These guys are saying that you can't just be faithful when you get married. Take it from a man that was 100% womanizer that slept with over 100 women by the age of 21. You can turn it off just like that. You know why? Because you didn't already experienced it. You didn't already done it. You realize this is what it is. It's just like when somebody leave crack cocaine. They don't practice leaving. They wake up one day and say, I'm done. And not every day you got to rededicate yourself every day. But it's actually harder for a man who ain't never done nothing, ain't never had him no bunch of legs open to get married and be 100% faithful because he ain't done nothing. So when he get in marriage, he thinking like, man, I need to experience something. I need to see something. I need to do something. So now he get introduced to new levels and new devils, and he can't handle it because he was never him. So that's how Jamal Bryant sleep with a stripper, get her pregnant or whatever it is and lose his marriage because it was never him. That's why I'm not in no scandal of having babies on my wife because I was actually him. I was that guy. So when I got married, I was able to boop. And so, yeah, it was women that I met and I'm like, ooh, but it's a test here, boy. Yeah. And it was like, oh, ooh, I'm about to fall. And so, yeah, when I got married, I get in there, oh. About to fall, then realize, oh, hey, got too close. Talk to my wife. Hey, baby, listen. She telling me, she like, listen, this right here with me, me telling her, hey, listen, this my struggle. This what I done did. She telling me, hey, this my struggle. This what I done did. Like, we still, we babies, 21 years old, 22 years old. She was 19. I was 21. We learning. We learning. But by the time I was 20, 23, we got married. When I turned 25, I turned over a new leaf at 25 of being marriage, really marriage minded. I had already been doing the right thing just off of my own power, my sheer will. At 25, I turned it over to God and said, Lord, I'm not going to be able to do this for the rest of my life without you. Like, yes, man got power, a little bit of power on their own, but it ain't going to sustain me until death do us part. I ain't going to be able to be faithful until death do us part without you, Lord. And that's when I repented for my heart not being placed in God's hand. And that's when I decided at 25 years old, and now I'm 39, next month I'll be 40. I'll be 40. I'm younger than the men talking, but telling a different story. But see, that's why you got to hear it from the horse's mouth. And so that's why the people out here, they can't, they can't find nobody that I'm sleeping with even though they know I was a womanizer and they thinking that, well, he got all these millions of women that follow him. It got to be a woman he having an affair with right now this very moment. It got to be a woman. He have, they can't find nobody. That's why ain't no woman coming out talking about I'm in an affair with Tony Gasson. Me and Tony Gasson sleeping together because she do not exist because God, a man can't change, but God. And here you got two pastors talking about a man can't turn it off. It's not the man turning it off. It's God. 
We change through the power of God. We're not changing on our own cognizance. We're not changing on our own power. It's the power of God that's changing us. So how is y'all pastors sitting up here talking about you got to practice abstinence before you get married so that you could be faithful to your wife? That's the stupidest thing I've heard in my ever entire life. You can't practice abstinence because that's a daily battle. You can't practice it for a year or six months or two years and then you finna be good when you get married. That's dumb. You got to fight that fight for the rest of your life. As long as you got a dangling, you're going to have to fight that fight. Ain't no practice finna prepare you for nothing. What's going to help you the most is making a decision and you making a decision in the dark. You making a decision in an instant and then you turn into the power of God. Then you able to confess and repent and say, Lord, it's not my will, but your will. It's not my power, but your power. How you a pastor and don't believe in the changing power of God? Shut that mess up, man. And that's why I get fed up with these clowns out here running their mouth. And that's why I can't align and collaborate because everybody want to collaborate as clowns. And everybody want to sit and talk as clowns and want to do all of this and that right there. And just like them boys called me the other day from the podcast. Hey, man, we want you to come on and do this right here and do this right here. I'm, no, I ain't doing it. I ain't doing no kind of collaboration like that no more. I'm done. Because cause one moment y'all have the truth on there, the next moment you got a babbling fool on there. The people is confused. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm going to have a singular message that is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and that's going to be my only message. That right there. The changing, loving power of God. That's what it's going to be. And listen, as black men, we got to grow up. We got to mature. We got to fall in line with the Holy Spirit, surrender our will, our ego, our past, our present, and our future to God. And we got to become real men. Stop talking about what you don't know nothing about. Talk from your experience and from the wisdom of God. And make sure that it's going to apply across the board. Other than that, shut up. And then stop crying and complaining. And you got to understand. And to the ladies, y'all got to get out the way of men's maturation. Stop coddling and enabling grown boys. If a man don't want to work no job, he don't deserve to make it. He don't deserve to be rich and famous if he don't want to work no job. Let him go live with his grandma. Just like the boy Desert Banks said, he had to go back to his grandma. What I told you, grandma be enabling, mama be enabling. But it was not the support of grandma that made him successful. What it was, what made him successful is the anger he had for that girl who stood up for herself and say, you not finna be no grown musky man trying to put hard dangling in me, but don't want to work no full-time job and help pay these bills that you sucking up. So you, you darn skippy, you're going to have to go live with your grandma if you don't want to get no real job while you chasing a fantasy. So that's what happened. That's what happened. But it was that anger with her that made him, that made him rich and famous, that made him famous. And, and listen, that stuff right there, you got to keep it going. You got to keep creating. You got to keep being in genius. And this is a conversation that I sit down and have with any man and tell him to his face, yeah, she supposed to leave you. When I decided after going to get a full-time job, working a job, and I decided to go back to living in the street, selling drugs, I'm happy my wife left me. If she had not left me, if she had said to me, well, okay, I understand our son is in intensive care unit and you trying to just make more money in addition to the working 40 hours a week, you want to sell some weed to make a few extra hundred dollars or, or a couple thousand a week or whatever you're going to make. To help us because our son intense care unit. It's a lot of women that will say, okay, white, black, Hispanic, indifferent. It's a lot of women that will say, okay, but my wife said no. I say, so you saying you would rather struggle as tight as it is for us because you can't work right now because our son needs somebody around the clock. You would rather us struggle and can't pay certain bills and be late on bills and about to get a, evicted every month versus me going out here and just selling a little bit of weed. She say, absolutely, I would rather be broke than to be with a man that is going to put his family in jeopardy 
by living that type of lifestyle. Cause I hadn't, I had done, oh, that one, that, that one before. I, I got robbed after that. But she knew it was gonna lead to nothing, and so she said, "I will remove myself, and I will be a single mom if you don't want to live a legal lifestyle and do what you're supposed to do. You working a full time job, just that'll be enough." We get financial aid from school. You get financial aid. I get financial aid. We'll add that twenty five, thirty thousand a year is right there from school refund checks. We getting thirty thousand a year from school refund checks. You make twenty thousand on your job. That's fifty thousand a year. We gonna have to make that fifty thousand a year work. I said okay, all right. That's what you want. And I remember paying bills, and we would have twenty five dollars to get us through two weeks. We would go to Wendy's drive through and we would get two chicken sandwiches, 99 cent a piece. We would go to Taco Bell on other days and we would get two bean burritos, 89 cent a piece. We would go to the grocery store and we'll get uh, ramen noodles and we'll take the ramen noodles and we'll put them in the pan. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll cook them first, put them in the pan, turn that pan on and walk them up. Throw a little soy sauce in there, walk them up, have them fried ramen noodles. We, those was our three go-to meals right there. Bye, bye, bye. The 99 cent menu at Wendy's, 99 cent menu at McDonald's, 99 cent menu at Taco Bell, and ramen noodles. So when you see my wife, and I tell you my wife got three cars that she got an Escalade brand new, she got a Range Rover brand new, and she got a convertible Benz brand new. If you got a problem with it, you could kiss my behind because that woman was there for me and she pushed me into greatness. She pushed me into purpose and she refused to, she refused to stand beside me if I was going to be less than my best. If I was going to try to take shortcuts, if I was going to try to be a drug dealer, she refused to continue supporting that. She had already stood beside me before when I was selling drugs and it was just enough to get her hooks in me. It was enough to get her influence in place. And then once she realized she got her influence in place, she used her influence to help me become great, to help me become the man I am today. So when you see her Birkin bag or Dior or Gucci Louis, whatever the finest materials, the finest brands, when you see her dripped up, draped out, when you see her took care of, understand she was there from the bottom. We used to get that block of cheese. That big block of cheese from Wick, that peanut butter. You used to get that little the Wick where you get the little powder stuff, the little cereal. You get this, and we was on Wick. Then we was on food stamps. I was out here doing speaking engagements at the early of my career, and we was on food stamps, getting I don't know what it was, five hundred, eight hundred, or something every month. And she had the she had the file as if she was single to get them food stamps, and I was living there. And then as my name started to grow. Probably about 2010, I said, baby, you, you're going to have to get off them food stamps because eventually the person who processing your application going to see my name. And and they're going to be like, oh, Tony Gaskins on food stamps? I was like, yeah, my daddy got the same name. And yeah, my son got the same name. Uh, yes, yeah, white men with the name Tony Gaskins too. But still, I don't want nobody to figure this thing out. <clears throat> so she counseled the food stamp. And we continued to struggle. And then, boom, here come a partner. And we went to that next level. And we went to that next level. And when I left that job for one year, the next year, I went from making $20,000 on that job. That next year, I earned $147,000. I done told this story a million times, and it ain't never changed. Anybody who done heard this story, I just, I just tell you more details. But the parts I tell you ain't never change. Because you ain't got to remember when you telling the truth. So I don't embellish the story like these celebrities be sitting out here doing all this doggone lying about they were homeless and all of this and they were this and that, telling all these doggone lies. I don't embellish the truth. Tell you exactly what it is. And this how I know what I know. And this is why I'm trying to tell you that as black men, we got to suck it up and we got to grow. Pause. Don't be watching what you suck up now. You got to suck it up and you got to grow. You got to mature as a man. You got to stop blaming a woman. Stop being mad with a woman. Stop stop expecting a woman to carry you. And you got to be willing to work a full-time job, pay the bills, pay the bills, carry your own, and just chase your dream on the side. You got to be willing to do it. 
Hey, this Tony Gasson. God bless you. My alarm probably about to go off. I got to coach today. My wife just texted me, so I need to see what she talking about. And I've been talking so long, my TV done cut off on me. God bless you. We'll talk soon. Hey, make sure you get on over to TonyGassonAcademy.com. Support some positive, some purposeful. You're going to see King the Wife, King the Husband. King the Husband going to be released tomorrow. and But King the Wife, it released today. It was up for pre-order, but the videos are available now. God bless you. We'll talk soon. TonyGassonAcademy.com.